We're at chapter five. Sorry, I didn't find a bigger one. Uh, this chapter is called Creek. And um, I really like this chapter because that's the first time the three companions are going to be together. And it kind of seals their friendship and their journey actually starts after this chapter. I hope you enjoy it. Chapter 5. Krieg. Over the next few days, Joshua and the wolf walked the land, crossing streams and climbing one hill only to walk down on the other side and up onto the next. Both stayed within their own thoughts for the most part until, on the third day, they were coming over yet another hill when they saw an old barn amongst the a small settlements of buildings. Do you feel this? Joshua thought. No. What is it? Gray answered. I have felt this before. In my pen. We were two roosters at first. But the other one was almost twice my size and he picked at me and the other hens constantly. One morning the door to the pen opened and the farmer came in and grabbed the other rooster and brought him to a spot next to the house. He laid him on a large block of wood and at that moment a wave of fear and terror reached me from him like nothing I've ever felt before. I felt the same from you just before I took the fox. They looked at each other for a moment. There's something down there. It's a large animal and, and I think it's afraid for its life. We have to go help him. And without any further thought, he flew down the hill and toward the large barn. Gray had no choice but to follow. We should probably avoid settlements like this, he thought to Joshua. I know, Joshua answered. We can't avoid, we can't avoid this one. Waves and waves of fear came from within the barn, and Joshua had to muster every ounce of his strength not to be overcome by the strong feeling of terror. He flew up to a windowsill and peered inside. There were three men. Two of them held the reins of a huge horse. It must have been a war horse at some point. It was massive, dark brown with black mane, white markings and extensive feathering. The third man held something that looked like a bolt gun. Joshua had seen this before on the farm. It had been used to slaughter pigs and cows. It was usually held to the animal's forehead and a bolt came out, penetrating the skull and killing it instantly. They're going to kill him! We have to do something! Joshua flew off the windowsill and ran around the barn and through the open door. When he saw the horse from down here, he was even bigger than before. He stood on his hind legs, fear clearly showing in his eyes. Joshua flew up in the air, screaming loudly, while trying to lure the man's attention toward him. The one with the bolt gun tried to kick him several times, and Joshua evaded him each time but barely. Let's get this over with, one of the other two men said. I don't have all day. Get my rifle. He gestured toward a shelf on one of the walls. The man with the bolt gun turned towards it. At that moment, the wolf stepped quietly into the barn. Everything slowed down. Joshua could see the dust particles in the air around Gray's head, who stood in a beam of sunlight coming in from a gap in the barn siding. The man with the bolt gun saw him first. He was so stunned that he completely froze. The two others saw the man stop in his tracks and, following his gaze, saw the wolf as well. With a low snarl he stood, teeth barred, the coat at his neck standing up. You will never reach that rifle, Gray thought to the man closest to him. Not that the man understood his thoughts, but he realized at that moment that he had no chance of reaching the rifle and shooting the wolf in time. He backed away. The horse pulled his head backwards and the reins slipped out of one of the man's hands. The other couldn't hold his either and the horse was suddenly free. He stood up on his hind legs, causing one of the men to fall backwards, nearly missing a blow from one of the horse's hooves. 
the image of the horse on its hind legs and the wolf standing across from it in the beam of light inside the barn was so powerful and awe-inspiring uh, awe inspiring in Joshua's eyes that for one moment he forgot the terror he felt. Then all hell broke loose as the wolf charged at the man with the nail gun. Joshua was struck by the man's screams and fear for their lives. It was equal to the horse's panic from just a minute ago. As the wolf hit the man and pushed him to the ground, the horse jumped over both of them and bolted through the open door. Joshua thought at first that the wolf would kill the man, but then he realized that he was just standing on the man's chest, his bare teeth only inches away from the man's face. He was in absolute terror. We should go, Joshua thought to the wolf. Gray, he yelled in his thoughts. The wolf turned his head as if coming out of a trance. We have to leave now. For a moment longer, the wolf looked at the man. Then he turned and ran outside, followed by Joshua. They cleared the barn and Joshua saw Gray break through thick bushes and down an embankment to a small stream. They're going to hunt us. The wolf's thoughts reached Joshua as they made their way down the stream. Joshua flew most of the part, but he knew he couldn't keep this up for much longer. I'm too slow, I won't make it, Joshua thought to the wolf. If they catch me, they'll catch you. You should run. They won't have any interest in a rooster if they can hunt a wolf. I will not leave you, the wolf thought. You will have to if you want to live. Joshua felt his strength leave him quickly. He wasn't used to flying or using his wings at all. In the last few days, he had used them more than ever before in his life. Now he felt every push as a strain. Go, he thought to the wolf. From a distance, he could hear the men yelling to each other. He could only hear a few words. Hunt, kill, wolf. I can take them, the wolf replied. No, you cannot. You cannot take three men with rifles. You must go. I will not. And with that, Gray turned around and headed back toward the voices of the men. No, Gray, you can't do this. At that moment, the horse broke through the underbrush, just in front of the wolf. For a second, horse and wolf looked at each other, a hint of fear in the horse's eyes. Jump on my back, the horse thought to Joshua. What? You heard right. Jump on my back and hold on to my mane. That's your only chance. The wolf looked flustered. A rooster riding a horse? Do it, now, or you just saved me for nothing. Joshua made a conscious choice at that moment, not to think about what would happen, but rather to just do it. Without another thought, he jumped, flew, and landed on the horse's back. Hold on! The horse thought, and with that, turned around and broke through the brush and into the open meadow. What followed was the, was the wildest ride of Joshua's life. He dug his talons into the horse's back, and if it felt it, it didn't let him know. He realized very quickly that he needed to stay low if he wanted to stay on at all. The large war horse flew across the meadow with the wolf at its side. Joshua felt the sheer power of the horse's muscles under him, but he also felt its utter joy of having escaped certain death, of running fast as the wind, pushing against the earth beneath its hoofs. Joshua couldn't help but be infected by this array of emotions, and to his complete surprise, he let out a rooster call that was filled with his own joy, joined with the horses. The call was heard in the farthest reaches of the valley by creatures large and small, and some of them felt the joy inside their hearts as well. And for the smallest of moments, they were all with him. They eventually slowed down into a trot, and by nightfall they rested by a small stream that flowed into a still pond. The cover of snow that had fallen earlier made the night even quieter. Joshua sat on a low branch in a large pine tree. Gray lay below him on the pine needles, licking his paws. They were raw from the day of running on the harsh ground. The horse stood by the edge of the pond, grazing off a small patch that was more dirt than grass. 
His reins were tangled with small branches and covered in mud from the escape. Joshua could feel the throbbing pain the horse had in his mouth from the metal reins pulling at it all day. I can take this off for you if you want, the wolf thought. Joshua saw in his mind's eye the image of the horse lying down in front of the wolf and Gray with his teeth taking the leather strips of the reins and pulling them over the horse's head. The war horse turned his head and looked at Gray for a moment. There was hesitation in his eyes. It was accompanied by another image the three of them shared. It was of such brutality that the wolf got up suddenly, his neck hair standing up and his upper lip pulling back, teeth barred. Joshua let out a terrified rooster call and flew down from the branch. It was a scene from a war. There were dead soldiers everywhere and blood mixed with the dark soil in the ground. A group of eight horses huddled together near a barren tree on the vast battlefield. The tree was their only shelter. They had mud and dried blood all over them. Some of the blood was their own. Some came from the soldiers who fought on them or whom they fought against. There were dead horses among the men. Their bodies seemed peaceful as if they had escaped the terror of the battle at last. The few soldiers that were left took care of the wounded. There was suddenly movement on the edge of the field. Something drawn near. Through the fog, it was hard to make out at first. But then the horses caught the scent, and terror spread among them like wildfire. The pack of wolves that came out of the high grass looked like an image straight from the depth of hell. They were starved and starving, filthy, eyes red with bloodlust standing clearly in them. Without warning, they leaped toward the horses. The horses, worn and tired beyond comprehension from days of battle, did not have the strength to flee. The wolves moved quickly, and Joshua saw their horse. He stood on the edge of the group, watching as one of the wolves flew toward him, jumping, mouth open, with claws ready to rip into his flesh. The only thing the horse could do at this moment was move forward and meet the wolf in mid-air. The horse stood up on his hind legs and jumped. He and the wolf met and for a moment were face to face. The image of the wolf's face so close to his own was burned into the horse's mind. And even though now safe and far away from the battlefield, it took all possible control for him not to take off and run, run away from it and never confront it again. How did you escape? Joshua asked after a while. I don't remember, the horse answered. All I know is that I never saw the others again. I don't know if they survived or what became of them. I'm sorry, the wolf thought into the silence. Then he walked over to the horse and lay down in front of it. His head on his paws, he looked up at the large war horse. I can help you with your reins, he quietly thought to him. As the horse looked at the wolf, the moon broke through the clouds, illuminating the snow-covered ground and reflecting in the still pond. For a while, the horse stood motionless. Then it went down on its front legs and lay on the ground across from the wolf. Joshua watched from a short distance as Gray slowly got up and walked toward the horse. Without hesitation, he took the bridle in his mouth, right between the horse's ears, and slowly pulled on the leather strip. It slid off and the horse was free. Thank you, the horse thought. No, I thank you, the wolf replied. What's your name? Joshua asked after a moment. Creek, the war horse answered. What does it mean, Creek? It means war, just war. I was bred for the war, born during the war, and trained for battle. Is that where all your scars came from? Joshua asked. The horse looked toward the dark horizon, lost in its thoughts. I have seen death, and too much of it. On the battlefields of Toulouse, 
where men fought men for land that belonged to neither, for riches that held no value other than a handful of sand that amounted to nothing. I saw blood there that ran like crimson rivers across the charred soil. It spilled from brothers and fathers and sons, from big hearts and small ones, and the blood of each flowed into the others, and in death they became one once again, and they forgot why it was they had fought. He turned toward Joshua and the wolf. I just want peace. I do not wish to fight for my life anymore. I'm too old, too tired. Soon, soon I will follow my father's path into the great vast grasslands, where the sun never sets and the water is plenty, and where there's peace for all living things. Until then, I'm in your debt, Joshua, in both of yours. Until then, tell me how you are not indebted to me, Creek, not in the slightest. Joshua answered, anyone would have done the same for you. Be that as it may, Red One, the debt stands until it is paid to both of you. End of discussion. All was still after Creek spoke. Joshua looked from the horse to the wolf, letting his eyes rest on each of them for a moment. He realized that the two creatures would probably not be friends under normal circumstances. But under normal circumstances, neither of the three would likely be friends with either of the other two. I had a dream, Joshua thought into the silence, a dream of three feathers somewhere in the depth below the storm mountains. In my dream, the feathers were so dear to me and I to them that I want to find them. I'm not sure what they mean or if they mean anything at all, but I know in my heart that I must find them even though I do not know why. As he looked at the others, he knew that they saw what he saw, an immense cave with the three feathers resting on a black, polished cylinder of stone. I will help you, Creek thought. Your peace is mine, Joshua of the Great Lake. And mine, Gray added. The night held its breath for a moment. The moon stood low and clear in the sky, and it seemed as if everything around them became a quiet witness to this pact. And Joshua, for the smallest of instants, had an inkling of what it means to have companions by his side. We're at chapter 6. water. They walked for three days, crossing a valley that stretched out for miles before them, and passing through a densely wooded forest where the branches built a thick roof above their heads. They rested by small streams where they stilled their thirst. Gray caught a few large fish, and there was more than plenty of food for Creek and Joshua. And all the while, they shared with each other their stories and their lives, as they remembered them. They shared their fears and joys, their shortcomings and their triumphs. But most of all, they came to know what each of them longed for. Creek's deep wish for peace, Gray's longing for the love of his dead companion, and Joshua's powerful dream that he felt he could no longer live without. On the end of the fourth day, they knew of each other what seldom is known except in long and deep friendships. As they walked, the weather changed. They left behind the snowy hills and reached an area where the sun lay on fields of grass that was just about to spring up through the frozen soil. Soon the first blossoms would be visible, pushing through the darkness toward the sunlight. The three friends felt that the spring around them that was about to meet the last days of winter mirrored their own journey, their own leaving behind their past and venturing toward something bigger still unknown, but no longer completely hidden from them. Then the howling began. They had just settled down for the night when they heard it. First it came from one direction, then another, and yet another. Wolves? 
was Joshua's first thought. No, Creek answered. Those wolves I encountered a long time ago were bred for the war, starved by their masters to feed on the fear of the survivors. I have not encountered them since. Creek is right, Grey thought. Those aren't wolves. I would know. What I do know is that whatever it is, it has, by now, completely surrounded us. What shall we do? Joshua asked. Jump on my back, the horse thought to Joshua. Before Joshua could follow Creek's thought, he saw an image of a pack of hyenas in the mind, in his mind, coming from the wolf. A dozen of them, maybe two. I can take four, maybe five, but a dozen? I have no chance against them. We have to run. Jump, the horse thought to Joshua. As Joshua jumped, wings fluttering onto the warhorse's back, the wolf charged in the opposite direction. I'll divert them, he thought. I can outrun them easily. And he was gone, a gray shadow disappearing into the dark of night. Three of the hyenas appeared and charged toward Joshua and Creek, who went on his hind legs and jumped forward. The hyenas changed direction to cut off their escape path. As they came closer, Joshua saw their large fangs and powerful jaws snapping at the horse's legs. Hold on tight! Creek's thoughts reached him just at the moment when the horse changed direction as well and went straight into the path of the two hyenas to his right. He trampled them, his powerful hooves crushing them and pushing them into the ground. The third one evaded the hooves, but barely. It held its distance, knowing that the rest of the pack would catch up soon. Can you outrun them? Joshua asked Creek. I don't know, but we will find out very soon, he thought. The howling now came from ahead of them as well. The eerie cries of the hyenas made Joshua's skin crawl. Don't be afraid, Creek thought to him. They will feed on your fear, and that fear will come back to you twice as strong. It will make you weak. I can't help it, Joshua thought. There seem to be so many. As they galloped through the night, yellow eyes watching them from all directions, and the cries from the hyenas coming ever closer, it dawned on Joshua that they might not make it. Follow me. Gray was suddenly next to them. He turned to the right. Creek changed direction and followed the wolf's lead. Through the pounding of the hooves and the eerie cries of the hyenas, Joshua suddenly heard something else, something loud and powerful. It came closer fast. What is that? He thought. Water. Joshua caught the glimpse of an image from Creek. Water? The thought hung in front of Joshua for a moment and through the sheer blackness of the night, Joshua suddenly saw a river next to them. It was flowing fast, almost as fast as they ran. The hyenas closed in on them from the other side. The three companions were trapped between the pack of hyenas and the raging river. But why is it so loud all of a sudden? Joshua was overwhelmed by the deafening sound of the water. The answer hit him an instant later. It's a waterfall! We have to stop! We're going directly toward a waterfall! In his panic, Joshua dug his talons deeper into the horse's back. We can't stop. Not anymore. Hold on! The horse's thoughts hit Joshua. He felt Creek's and Gray's utter desperation, joined with his own. Creek pushed through the last of the high grass bushes and was suddenly suspended in mid-air. Joshua let go of the horse's back, lifting off, his wings unfolding. He saw Gray jump as well. Joshua felt gravity pulling him down. He struggled to land on a small, tree-like branch jutting out of the rock. From there, he watched Creek and Gray fall and crash into the icy water 15 feet below. Then he saw two of the, two of the hyenas fall over the edge. They couldn't stop in time and fell down as well. Creek and the wolf tried to swim to the side of the large pool, but the current was too strong. They were inevitably pulled into a second waterfall and moments later disappeared over the edge. Joshua thought about it only for a second before he spread his wings again and flew down. He couldn't swim, so hitting the water was not an option. 
when he was above the second waterfall, he realized that this one was, was much higher than the first, at least 50 feet. The noise was deafening. Joshua barely made it over the edge without crashing into the water, nearly missing one of the hyenas. He looked into its eyes and felt his own fear reflected in them. Then it went over the edge. The mist of the falls clung to his feathers, making them heavier as he, as he tried very hard not to lose too much height. There was a rock sticking out of the water far down from where he was. He had to make it there and land on it, otherwise he would certainly drown. He saw Gray and Creek swimming toward it and hoped they would reach it as well. He realized that if he stretched his wings just a tiny bit outward, he wouldn't have to struggle so much to stay in the air. Who says roosters can't fly, he thought, when suddenly a gust of wind pushed him down and toward the water. He was completely unprepared and could only counter it with one or two flaps of his wings before he crashed into the water. He went under, immediately pushed down by a strong undercurrent. Instinctively he held his breath, but it became clear to him that he had only a few seconds before he would pass out. Where are you? He heard Gray in his thoughts. Underwater was the only thing he could think of in his panic. For a moment, nothing seemed to happen. Joshua Boat was picked up by another undercurrent and pushed to the side, upside down, turning over and over underwater. Hold on to me, he heard Gray. Joshua, more out of instinct than anything else, dug his talons into what he thought was the fur of the wolf's hind leg. Don't let go. Gray swam toward the surface and was almost there when another strong current took hold of Joshua and he lost his grip. Luckily, this brought him to the surface where he flapped weakly while trying desperately to get air into his lungs. Suddenly, he was grabbed by sharp teeth. For a moment, he thought it was one of the hyenas, but then the teeth very gently pulled him out of the water without so much as a scratch. Gray carried Joshua onto the small island and dropped him on the stone. One of the hyenas tried to climb onto the island as well, but Creek just stood there looking at it. The hyena let go eventually and was, seconds later, swept away by the current. The wolf shook himself, water spraying in all directions. Joshua, unable to move, was exhausted beyond anything he had experienced before in his life. He couldn't lift even a wing. Are you hurt? The horse asked. I don't think so. You should try to shake out your feathers. Otherwise they might freeze during the night. It's not over yet. Gray's thoughts reached both. What do you mean? We have to swim across to the shore. This is just an island and we can't stay here for long. We should wait until morning and then swim over, Creek replied. I don't think that's a good idea, Gray answered. This island is very low and close to the water. If it starts to rain, it might flood. If the river swells, the current will be even stronger. Joshua, Joshua lifted his head and shook it. I don't think I can make it. Can't we just stay? I can take you on my back. I agree with the wolf. We can't stay here. There's something else. The wolf's gaze went beyond the edge of the water. What? Joshua tried to stand up but sat back down immediately, a wave of dizziness going through him. Hollow's gate. Hollow's gate? Joshua asked. It was called the Big Deep in ancient, ti in ancient times, Creek answered. Many wars have been fought over it, and because of it. It is said it holds riches that nobody can comprehend. No one ever came back from it except the eagles, and only because they were able to use the upward winds to return. What is it? Joshua asked. He had heard of it from birds and geese that either lived at the farm or had taken rest in one of the small pools of water on their way north. Had he heard what he had heard were only legends. According to them, it was a place clouded in darkness, and only creatures who avoided the light lived there. Hollow's Gate was a, was a gorge, 
fifty miles in diameter, swallowing everything that came near it, even the air to breathe. The walls that surround it, Grey thought, are straight, a sheer cliff dropping at least five thousand feet down. There's no path to the bottom that I know of, and there certainly is no way back up. We have to bypass it completely if we were to get to Storm Mountain. The current here is very strong, Joshua thought. He could see the water moving rapidly toward the edge and from there into nothingness. If we fall over the edge, we will die. Gray's matter-of-factness was strangely comforting. As if on cue it started to rain, Joshua was tired beyond belief. The cold made him shiver and the thought of having to cross the rushing water was almost paralyzing. Let's do it, he thought to the others. Creek, if I fall off your back, I want you both to try to make it to the other side. Do not worry about me. He tried to sound much stronger than he was and much more forceful. Gray and Creek just looked at each other as if to say, Sure, we'll leave you to go to your certain death while we save ourselves. It's just not going to happen. Joshua got up tried to shake out as much water as he could. His wings felt as if they were dipped in lead. He could barely walk, when, but when the horse went down on his front legs and lay down, he climbed up onto his massive back. We will make it, Creek thought to him. I hope you're right, Joshua thought back. He wasn't convinced. That you don't trust your own strength doesn't mean I don't have any left. It also doesn't mean you can't trust mine, the horse thought. There's no arguing with that, Joshua thought to himself more than to the others. The horse stood up and walked to the edge of the small island. The wolf stood next to him. It was at least a hundred feet to the other side, and there wasn't much room for error. The thought of death wasn't even the most disconcerting to Joshua. What terrified him more than anything was the thought of just disappearing into a fathomless gorge that would swallow them into oblivion. Before he could dwell any further, Creek went into the water and was immediately caught by the current. Gray, upstream from them, went in as well. The current was much stronger than they expected. What followed now was one of the most terrifying ordeals in Joshua's life. One of the reasons for it was that he had no control at all, not of the current and not of Creek's movement through the rushing water. Several times he was submerged and could barely hold on to Creek's mane. Too slowly they made their way across. The edge seemed to come closer much faster than the other side. Gray was pushed against Creek, who was heavier and floated slightly slower than the wolf. At one point, Joshua thought that the horse would topple over, but he somehow managed to stay upright. Hot panic suddenly rose inside him when he realized that they wouldn't make it across in time. There was too much distance left. He had visions of them falling over the edge and disappearing into utter blackness. He also realized that his weight, albeit not that much, caused additional strain to Creek, who was struggling as it was to not be swept away by the strong current. I don't think we'll make it, Joshua thought. I'm going to try to fly over. No. Creek's thoughts left no room for doubt or opposition in Joshua's mind. Stay where you are. As they moved toward the edge, too fast and with utter inevitability, Joshua suddenly found himself back in the coop, huddled up against the other chickens to keep warm, not quite awake, but also not completely asleep. There was comfort there and warmth. Part of him wanted to just go back there in his mind and stay there, hold on to it until the fall over the edge would kill him eventually. It wouldn't be that painful, he thought. Just slip away, let go of this tortured body and... Joshua! The wolf stood in his mind, teeth barred. Joshua's thoughts were pulled back from the edge. He felt the horse's panic under his talons. He saw Gray fighting for his life. He thought that he would, could not do anything to help them, overwhelmed him, and pushed away the fear for his own life. No, he thought, 
there must be something I can do. And with that, he jumped up in the air, lifted off the back of the horse, and flew toward the other side. He knew he probably wouldn't make it, but he thought that without his weight on Creek's back, the horse might have a fighting chance to reach safety. He gained about ten feet of height, and for a moment he caught a glimpse over the edge. But there was only blackness. Once he flew up, his strength left him almost immediately, and it was as if his tortured muscles just stopped responding to his command to fly. He dropped and hit the water, the current instantly taking him and pushing him toward the edge. Creek and Gray no longer tried to get to shore, but swam towards him. Suddenly, while his body was turned over and over by the current and losing all sense of where he was, he remembered that he saw a small path to the side of the falls, as if carved into the stone, large enough to carry a horse. When you go over the edge, try to jump to the right. There's a path, he yelled in his thoughts, not knowing if the others would even hear him. Then he felt sharp rock under his talons and a push from the side. With that, he was catapulted into the night and out of the water. For a moment, he thought he fell into nothingness. But then, an instant later, he landed on rock, tumbled a few feet and lay still. He drifted in and out of consciousness and went from blackness to blurry images of the wolf and the horse standing over him, cascades of water dripping down from them. We are safe, he heard Gray in his thoughts. And when he heard it, he knew it was true, and he fell into a deep sleep. He dreamed of a large cave and three feathers on a blackened stone, and of three companions and the bond they shared. When he awoke the next morning, the sun was high in the sky, and Joshua found himself huddled against the wolf's belly. His whole body hurt when he tried to move his wings. Creek stood a few feet away, trying to find grass on the rocky ground. The whole side of the horse was covered in abrasions. Are you hurt? he asked him. I live. Nothing life-threatening. I'm glad to have those. Scraping over the stones was what slowed me down enough to make the jump. How did we... I can't even remember anything. Joshua's vision was still blurry as he tried to find his balance on the rocky ground. We made it just in time, Gray thought to both of them. I'm glad you live. For a while, we weren't sure if you would make it. There was no reason to relive something that Joshua couldn't remember, so he didn't pursue it any further. As he began to walk around the wolf, he saw that Gray had blood on his coat as well. We're pretty beat up, he thought. The wolf smiled in his thoughts. That we are. Aren't you glad you saved me from the fox? Not waiting for an answer, he stepped around and now got a full view of where they were. To their left, the waterfall disappeared into the abyss below. To their right, there was a path cut into the stone, into the sheer cliff. The path led away from the plateau they stood on. How far it went, Joshua could not see, but it seemed as if it went slightly downward. This could have been an optical illusion, for the massive wall of rock that disappeared into the fog below curved in the distance, and it looked as if, tens of miles in diameter, the wall of stone made a large circle ending on the other side of the waterfall next to them. What now? Joshua asked. We can't go back. We can't go down there. <clears throat> There's only one way for us to go, and it is to follow along the path in front of us. Gray got up. There's no path for us to take but this one. As it happened before, Joshua could not escape the logic in the wolf's thoughts. We leave in the morning, Creek thought to them. Find some rest. We might need it. <clears throat> the remainder of the day, Joshua spent sleeping and once in a while looking for food on the rocky ground. The sound of the waterfall was their constant companion. It was at times calming and at others unsettling. Each time he drifted into sleep, he dreamed of falling endlessly until he woke, shaking from the cold and the terror of it. He asked Creek twice if they could just go now instead of waiting here. 
There was no food for the wolf and he was worried that there wouldn't be any for a while. Joshua could always find something on the ground and Creek would probably always find grass somewhere, but the wolf couldn't survive without eating for more than a couple of days. I will be fine, Gray answered in his thoughts. Do not be concerned about me. As they looked at each other, Joshua realized for the first time how completely different they were. They had, under normal circumstances, absolutely nothing in common, except perhaps the one thing that one was hunter, the other prey. And yet, here they were, at the edge of an abyss with nothing but each other to rely on. Why did you help me? he asked into the silence. What do you mean? Gray answered. When I stood before the foxhole, why did you help me? For a long while, the wolf did not respond. All Joshua could see in his mind were fleeting images of Gray's companion when both roamed the ice forests together. I do not know the answer. The wolf looked at him. I just knew I had to... The longing in you was so strong and powerful, I wanted to help you find whatever it was you are looking for. Maybe so I could find whatever it is I am searching for as well. So far we've been pretty successful, don't you think? Joshua wasn't quite sure if he meant this as a joke. It could be worse, the wolf answered. They both smiled in their thoughts. And when night came, and then dawn, and the morning painted the sky in colors of deepest orange, they were ready to continue on their journey. Hi everybody, we're at chapter 7, and um, I just realized that all the other six chapters, um, the image that you're seeing is reversed, is mirror reversed. Um, and you wouldn't be able to see my Brooklyn uh, hoodie. Um, and also you have, probably if you've seen the book like this, it was all, uh, the mirror was uh, switched. And um, I fixed that, so we're ready to go. Um, chapter seven is actually the first chapter where the book goes into a different directions. It begins to you, it begins to feel differently. It uh, introduces a character that is very close to my heart. And um, this character's name is Wind. Um, she's a Pegasus. And um, she's one of my favorite characters. She just kind of leads the book into a slightly different path that um, was very unexpected when I wrote it. Um, anyway. Chapter 7. Wind Joshua sat on Creek's back as they made their way along the slightly descending path. The smooth, granite-like rock to their right went straight up, and the further they went, the larger became the distance between them and the top of the cliff. Joshua imagined a large spiral going downward, ever deeper into an unknown world that he didn't really want to enter. What if they would have to keep walking indefinitely? It could take weeks for them to travel the distance, circling ever deeper and not knowing what awaited them at the bottom. The further they went, the more he began to feel Creek's restlessness, as if the horse had to actively stop himself from falling into a trot. When Joshua looked back at one point, he saw the waterfall far in the distance at the end of the slightly curving path. All of it still lay in the shadows. The sun was still low on the horizon, and it did not yet reach them from the other side of the valley. As they made their way along the path, Joshua couldn't help but wonder why he went on this journey to begin with. Doubts rose in his mind, doubts of the justification of all this. Was it all worth it? He began to think that whatever it was that had pushed or pulled him to go and leave his world, his place of belonging, was probably just a dream, no more than the senseless musings of a bored existence. Why in all the world did he have to go and fly out of the pen? 
Nothing seemed more preposterous at that moment, and he felt himself slipping into a deep hopelessness, grounded in the utter lack of purpose the journey suddenly seemed to have. There's something ahead of us. Creek's thoughts brought him back. At that moment Joshua realized that the thoughts he had, the feelings of hopelessness that had occupied his mind, were not solely his. The origin of it, however, was unclear, clouded in mist and veiled from him. A heart-rending howl escaped the wolf suddenly, and Creek jumped forward and fell into a gallop. <coughs> Joshua thought he saw something further down the path, sticking out of the smooth rock. Looking into the fog far below them, and having the sheer cliff going upward to his right, Joshua was afraid that they would inevitably lose their footing and fall down if they were to continue to gallop like this. He forced himself to concentrate on holding on to Creek's coat and mane. What do you think this is? he asked, mostly to distract himself from thinking about the sheer drop to his left and the claustrophobic closeness of the rock to his right. I don't know, Creek answered. I'm not sure about this, the wolf thought from behind them. We should be careful. Suddenly, out of nowhere, the, a path split off from the one they traveled on and led upward toward the top of the cliffs in a steep incline. It looked like a small, washed out and dry, narrow creek bed. They stopped. This most likely leads up to the top of the cliff, Gray thought. I suggest we follow it. From there we could just walk along the edge and bypass this altogether, Joshua thought. Creek moved restlessly. Joshua felt that the horse wanted to stay on their path until they found whatever it was that was further down. It's up to you, Joshua, Creek thought. We can go up here. It's steep, but we'll make it. Joshua felt the horse's conflict and made up his mind before Creek could form another thought. Let's go further down and find out what it is that sleeps there. Afterwards, we'll come back and go up the path to the top. He felt the horse's agreement and they silently continued down the path. Do you see this? There's something in the rock there, Gray thought. I see it too. It seems to stick out of the side of the cliff, Joshua answered. Wait. Creek stopped. What is it? Joshua asked. Let me go alone. Why? Gray asked. I don't know, but whatever it is that lays there, it might not be the best way to be woken up by a wolf standing over it. You have a point, but what if it's dangerous? Gray thought. Then I'll come back and we'll go the other way, the horse replied. Joshua could see a small plateau in the shadows where the unrecognizable shape was sticking out of the cliffs. He flew off the horse's back. Be careful, he thought. I will be, Creek answered. Keep your distance. If we have to run, I don't want to lose, I don't want you to too close to whatever this is. With that, the horse began to trot down the path. When he was about a hundred feet away, Joshua and Gray followed slowly. Creek reached the plateau and stopped before a sculpture of stone that seemed to be half melted into the cliff. At that moment, the sun came over the rim of Hollow's gate, illuminating the spot where Creek stood. And now, out of the shadow and completely in the light, Joshua and Gray saw what it was. The head was slightly smaller than Creek's, its features softer, more feminine. Its front hooves stood up from the ground and its back was melted into the stone cliff. With massive wings on either side, the stone pegasus looked as if it were about to take flight. The sun illuminated its ivory-colored surface. As Joshua and Gray came closer, they saw the pegasus expression. Its eyes were closed in contentment, as if she had willingly sought out this spot and also her state of being. Joshua had heard of the legends of the flying horses that lived in a city deep down in Hollow's Gate, but that was a long, long time ago. So long ago, it was almost forgotten. 
Creek's head was only inches away from the head of the stone pegasus. It was as if he dared not breathe, out of fear to disturb the creature. Joshua and Gray now stood on either side of the horse. Joshua felt he wasn't quite sure, but he could only describe it as awe. The magnificent beauty of the creature was unlike anything he had ever seen before. And yet, there was a sense of finality he felt while looking at her face. It crept up inside him and into his chest and made him gasp for air. Suddenly, Creek stepped backwards and went on his hind legs, letting out a cry that seemed to come out of sheer desperation. The wolf and Joshua moved backwards away from him. The horse started to pace back and forth, going on his hind legs several times and crying out each time. What is it, Creek? Joshua thought to him. There was no answer from the horse. Just a sense of desperation sweeping over Joshua that he had to shake himself to get rid of. Creek, what's going on? He thought, hoping to get through to the horse. Then the wolf began to wince and howl as if in utter pain. It was the most eerie thing Joshua had ever heard. That, mixed with the horse's cries, made the scene turn into something completely otherworldly. It seemed as if the wolf, the horse, and the stone pegasus shared in something that Joshua was not part of, or only on the periphery. Gray! Gray! he yelled in his thoughts. There was no answer. The wolf looked at him, unable to communicate. Creek began to frantically kick the stone around the Pegasus' hind legs, but to no avail. Finally, he stopped. So did Gray's howling. I can't save her, Creek thought to them. She wanted to be here. It was her choice to be frozen in stone for all eternity, for what she did. But once it happened, she realized that it was a mistake, that she shouldn't be in here, and now she can't escape. She hasn't been able to escape for more than 900 years. Joshua could feel Creek's sense of helplessness. All the strength, endurance, and power of this mighty warhorse were no match for the stone. Is there something we can do? Joshua asked. No. Creek answered. When he looked at Joshua, his eyes spoke to him more than anything. I have fought many wars. I have seen despair in friend and foe. I have seen pain and loss and plenty of it. But nothing captures my heart more than someone's inability to fight for freedom. Gray and Joshua looked at each other, sharing in their friend's sorrow. Creek walked close to the Pegasus and laid his head on the stone. Joshua watched as a single tear dropped down from the eyes of the warhorse and landed on the head of the Pegasus. All was quiet. Suddenly, it was as if the air became, den became denser around the plateau on which they stood. Something moved, even though nothing was visible to the naked eye. There was a stirring, and each of them felt it deep within themselves, as if something inside each of them, something that was captured and held prisoner a long time ago, was finally set free. Joshua and the wolf stepped back. Was it a trick their mind played on them, an optical illusion of sorts, when some of the stone feathers of the Pegasus' massive wings began to move slightly in the wind? Joshua realized at that moment that they were witnessing something that had not happened in eons, if ever. At that moment, he became aware of the Pegasus, not her features, but her mind. It was as if it had been submerged deep within her and finally found its way to the surface. There was an utter lightness to her being. Her mind was like a fountain of clear water sparkling in the sun. The sense of relief in her was so contagious that Joshua closed his eyes and let it envelop him completely. When he opened his eyes, he saw her wings begin to move. The sheer joy of her slowly regaining freedom had no boundaries. The wind streaming off her massive wings pushed Joshua down to the ground and suddenly there was a rumbling from deep inside the mountain as if it finally released her into freedom. The sound of the compressed air below her wings was like thunder. 
And then they heard a crack. Like a lightning strike, it went through them. Joshua didn't know what was happening at first. It all seemed to occur in slow motion. He saw the Pegasus on her hind legs, her massive wings moving up and down. He saw Creek standing to the side watching. Joshua felt more than saw the wolf slightly behind him across the Pegasus and toward the edge of the plateau. Suddenly, the ground beneath them gave way. At first, Joshua thought that Creek and the Pegasus, together with the cliff behind them, moved away from him. But then he realized that he and Gray were moving away from them. At that moment, he knew what the cracking sound was. A large part of the plateau on which they stood was breaking off, taking him and the wolf with it and disappearing into the depth below. And then they fell. Hey there, Ch chapter 8, Jump. This is the only chapter in the book that does not have Joshua in it. Um, at this moment, we don't know what happened to him and Gray. They fell into the abyss, and this chapter is about creek and wind and what happens to them. Creek saw Joshua and the wolf disappear over the cliff. It took all his strength not to jump after them, but he knew that this would be certain death. The Pegasus was still partially embedded in the stone when Creek saw that the path began to crumble and break off. We have to leave, he thought to the Pegasus. We have to leave now. The Pegasus looked around in panic, trying frantically to free herself. Help me. The thought stood clearly in Creek's mind. I don't want to die, and I'm still too weak to fly. He began to kick the rock next to her with his hind legs. The stone began to loosen, but not fast enough for him. The path back to safety crumbled more and more, but suddenly the Pegasus was free. Run, she thought to him. She didn't have to tell him twice. He took off racing up the crumbling path. The moment they stepped off the plateau, it broke off and disappeared into the depth below. It was now as if the destruction of the path raced Creek and the Pegasus. As fast as they ran, the breaking of the path gained on them until the Pegasus' hind legs were already pushing off loose rock. Here it is! And Creek jumped up and into the steep incline of the creek bed. The Pegasus followed and they both ran up the slippery path. Don't stop, just keep going, he reassured her. As they made their way up the steep mountainside, the entire path up to the waterfall began to crumble and break off. And when Creek and the Pegasus finally reached the top, there was nothing left of the path below. The sheer cliff was smooth, without any interruption, as if the path and the plateau had never existed. Panting, they stood on top of the cliff. Creek's joy of having escaped certain death was overshadowed by the pain of losing his friend. He still couldn't believe what happened. Creek had lost many fellow warhorses, and each one was as painful as the last. The sense of loss was a familiar one to him. I'm so sorry. The Pegasus must have heard his thoughts. When he looked at her, he saw it in her eyes, the knowledge of her having gained her life at the price of someone else losing theirs. She suddenly lost her balance and sank to the ground. Creek stepped forward, not quite sure what to do. I wished for someone to come and free me for so long. I knew I couldn't do it on my own. And then I felt your footsteps on the path, and there was the small hope that maybe this time. Several travelers came before you, but I never felt an anger so strong or the will to live and to give life than I felt in you. When you stopped at the fork, I hoped you would come and try. I think I heard you, Creek thought. I didn't know that death would be the price for my freedom, the Pegasus replied. Many of my fellow warhorses died for me in the war, as I would have died for them. But we live and we must honor those who died, not with more death, but with our lives. 
otherwise they died in vain. As the sun rose behind them, flooding the landscape with golden light, Creek could feel that, despite his words of wisdom he knew to be true, the loss of his friends cut deeper than he wanted to admit. There might be another battle for him to fight, the battle between the promise of a good life as payment to them and the sheer finality of losing their companionship. Only time would tell. The next day passed in a haze for Creek. They found a spring a little further south that carried clear cold water through a meadow where the snow and ice had melted almost completely. It will take me some time to get my strength back, the Pegasus thought to Creek, and when it comes back, I will go and look for your friends, for I know your thoughts are burdened with their absence. But do not trust a hope. Time flows at a different speed at the bottom of Hollow Skate than it does up here. You can spend one day at the surface, and it will be close to a week below. The Great Deep, as it was called, has its own laws, and what you believe right now might not be true down there. You are saying that Creek and the Red One have been down there for almost a week now? Creek could not fathom that they lay dead somewhere at the bottom of an ancient world where their bodies had already began to disintegrate. Do not let your thoughts go there, the Pegasus interrupted him. It is a dark place from which you cannot see. Creek looked at her. He could sense her lightness of being below his grief. The lightness was something he had not yet found within himself. You never told me your name. My name is Wind. I got it when I first learned to fly. I always thought the legend spoke of Pegasus foals that could fly right out of, out of the womb, Creek answered. There was a pause when she looked at him. No one has told you. No one has told me what, Creek replied. No one has told you how a Pegasus gets her wings. Creek saw a smile in her that suddenly seemed to flood through him as well. You are telling me that you never knew how we get our wings? No. That is so sad, Creek. You must know that I was not born with wings. None of us is. What do you mean? I mean having wings is not something we are given with birth, even though it is our birthright. Don't you know that we are horses? Horses? Creek was puzzled. Yes, horses. Creek, we are horses that learn to go past our limitations. We have been given the chance to fly to leave behind all that limits us and soar with the eagles high above the earth. We have been given freedom, Creek. For a while he was quiet. He became aware of the land around him and her presence next to him. How do you leave your limitations behind? He asked. Wind looked at him for a long time. There was kindness in her, born of knowing the strength it took, the faith in both the goal and the means to reach it. Your limitations. You must not believe them. You must not fuel them with doubt about yourself. You must know they are not and have never been part of you. You must know yourself. And not only must you know yourself, you must love it as well. Deep within, you must love you. Creek was quiet for a while. Within himself there was a small part, deeply submerged somewhere, that resonated with her thoughts. At that moment he knew that her words were true, but... You're asking what about the other part? The part that thinks you small and frail and puny? Wind finished his thought. Yes. You freed me from eternal imprisonment. I will help you go beyond your limits. I will help you get your wings. I will see you fly. That last part of her thought whispered to him. 
Creek's eyes stung suddenly, and he closed them to hide what he felt. It was as if his li whole life, all his struggles, the preparation for war, war itself, and all the horrors it brought, the time when he was captured and held prisoner, his friends freeing him and his pain of losing them again, flowed like small streams joining together toward a great river. He suddenly knew that his life was culminating in this. Not only that, but each step along the way had been a step toward it. He just never knew that that was the goal all along. Why did he never even have the slightest inclination that he could one day leave all that he thought would limit him behind? Or could he? He suddenly felt tired. I'm not so sure I can make it. I'm old, and the strength it takes to undertake this might be for younger steeds, more spirited horses, not an old war horse like myself. And with that, he closed the door that wind had opened. The sting of regret was easier to handle than the thought to ev even question his limits. It would never happen. And that was the end of it. It began just before dawn the next day. Creek had just awoken from a deep sleep. He caught the faintest sense of joy when he awoke. It fled from him when he opened his eyes. The sky was clear above him. Wind slept next to him. Her ivory coat had a slight glow from the light of the half-moon that stood low on the horizon. Suddenly the Pegasus woke. She jumped to her feet as if shaking off a dream. The beacon, she thought urgently. Come! She ran. Creek had no choice other than to follow her. Her graceful strides, wings half unfolded, captured him, and for a moment the wish to be like her overcame him. The wish to be free fueled him and let him gain on her until they were side by side, racing through the moonlit meadow and toward the cliff. Eventually they slowed down and reached the edge. Wind stared intently into the abyss. What are you looking for? Creek thought. Wait, Wind replied. I cannot believe I live to witness this. There was suddenly a gust of icy wind coming from deep below and going through them. It seemed as if the wind up here answered and another gust reached them, this time from inland. It is happening. Wind could not contain her joy. What is it? Creek asked. Look! At that moment, the depth below them began to glow. The fog covering most of Hollow's gate became illuminated from underneath in golden light. It was a magnificent sight. Then the fog and clouds in the middle of the large hollow began to move away and toward the edge. Small beams of light broke through the fog until they became one single beam that reached high into the night sky. When Creek looked at Wind, he saw her face reflecting the light from below. He knew at that moment that they were about to witness something extraordinary, something he couldn't even begin to understand. The beacon has been activated. The sky people will rise up into the heavens once more. I thought I'd never witness this again. She began to weep. For a while nothing happened, and then Creek saw it. More shadows than actual forms, he saw what looked like people, Dozens of them. Each of them seemed to sit on a bar that was connected by thin strings to a large sphere that looked like glass. They slowly floated upward toward the sky inside the beacon of light. These are my people. Your people? Creek asked. Will you believe me when I tell you that many centuries ago Pegasus and Sky People lived in a city down in the deep together as equals? Both watched as the figures floated up into the sky until they disappeared. Creek, I do not want you to be in the unknown about your friends any longer. Something is happening here that I do not yet fully understand, but I'm quite certain it has to do with your arrival. Our arrival? Creek asked. Yes, and the odd thing is 
that you, none of you, are mentioned anywhere in any prophecy or scripture or even folk tales. It is as you if you were not supposed to happen, but you were not supposed to fly, find each other, but you did. Extraordinary things happen when ordinary folk begin to imagine the unthinkable. I don't understand. We just got here because we were pursued by a pack of hyenas. We almost fell over the edge. I almost got killed by my captures five days past. We were just lucky to be alive. Luck has nothing to do with it. With anything, Creek. There is no such thing. It is something we invented to keep the power of our own mind at bay. It was not luck that you have found me. It was not luck that the beacon has been activated. I do not know what happened to your friends, Creek, but I will go and find out, and if they are alive, I will find them. There was a pause where she looked at him. I should go now. With that, she walked back from the edge. Now? Creek asked. I need a hundred yards, she said. Wind, how do you know that you can still fly? Creek asked. I don't, she replied, but there's only one way to find out. She went back further. Don't you want to wait a little longer, just to be sure? Creek realized that his concern was not only for her. What about him? What if she didn't come back? There was no way for him to get down below. He was also concerned about what wind would find down there. Whatever was left of Joshua and the wolf, if there was anything left. He felt trapped. Wind was about a hundred yards away from the cliff when she turned around to face the edge. Be careful, he told her. I will be. Will you wait here until I'm back? I don't know. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. She looked at him for a moment. I think you do, she answered. And with that, she jumped forward, both front hooves in the air, then raced with powerful strides toward the edge. Your limitations, Creek, he heard her in his thoughts as she approached the edge. They only exist in your mind. Free them and be free. She jumped. Creek followed her and watched her jump off the sheer drop and disappear. When he reached the edge, she was already far down. His heart stopped for a moment out of fear for her, but then he saw her wings unfold and the upward wings take her, transporting her almost back to his height. She pushed her wings down and flew past him, only to dive again. He could sense her immense joy. I remember, her ecstatic thoughts told him. I remember it, Creek. He stood at the edge of the sheer drop, looking down, and he felt something that he had felt only once since the, his days of the Great War. It was fear. It paralyzed him, made his mouth dry, and made his heart beat against his chest. Be free! The faintest thought reached him while he watched her disappear into the clouds. Be yourself and be free! He looked down into the deep for a while longer letting everything that he felt wash through him, take over and envelop him completely. Then he trotted about a hundred yards back from the edge and turned around. This was it. He would do this or die. The thought of the in inevitability of his choice let everything around him quiet down. Without hesitation, he jumped forward and began to gallop, concentrating only on his hooves, racing over the ground, carrying him toward the edge, toward either life or death. Thirty yards to go. He had reached his maximum speed. His powerful muscles pushed him further and further. Twenty yards. He could see the edge clearly before him, coming ever closer. Ten yards. He reached the point of no return. There was nothing stopping him, and with that thought, he jumped. He fell much faster than he had imagined he would. He had no frame of reference for falling this deep, this far. Back at the waterfall, he had gotten a small inkling, 
but this was a 5,000 foot drop. Just let it happen, he thought to himself. Just let it happen. Having reached terminal velocity at 54 yards per second, he had the strange sensation of hovering, even though the sound of the wind was deafening in his ears. He could not see anything, and part of him waited for the inevitable crash when he would hit the ground. Then he broke through the clouds, and for a split second he saw Hollow's gate far below him, and its beauty took his breath away. And then everything went black. <laughs>